The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalova Lyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Hello learners. Welcome to this revision lesson. I am Taso Gerard, your economics teacher. We will be revising GCE advanced level. The presentation, our general presentation, will consist of two phases. The first phase is the national economy. On the national economy, we'll have the following uh, topics, national income, secular flow of income, money and banking, and uh, public finance. And the second phase will be on international economics and economic policies. The topics involved are international trade, economic growth and development, managing the economy and population studies. Let's look at the structure of the exam. Advanced level economics is uh, divided into three papers, paper one, two, and three. Paper one is uh, the main objective is to demonstrate a sound knowledge of the principles of economics. Paper one contains um, or the weight is 30% of the total marks and it is made up of 50 MCQ questions. Let's go to paper two. The objective is to use economic concepts to explain, analyze, or evaluate economic decisions. This paper carries 40% of the marks and um, it is made up of eight questions. The first four under microeconomics and the other four under macroeconomics. And students are expected to answer five questions. Paper three, which has as objective to explain economic theory through verbal, numerical, as well as graphical or graphical and diagrammatical forms. This paper takes 30% of the total marks and uh, is made up of five data response questions and students are expected to answer three. Now, we are going to, in this uh, session, we are going to be looking at the main points under uh, that's the revision generally under the national economy, international economics and economic policies. Now, we'll start with the national economy. We're going to look at some important concepts of national income accounting. We'll start with um, defining national income, which is the money value of all goods and services produced in an economy within a period of one year. Actually, it's really estimated between the 1st of January and the 31st of December. We have personal income. That is the earnings received by an individual for taking part in the production of goods and services. Now we're talking about personal income presents a household's earnings when taxes have not yet been deducted. Then we go to personal disposable income. A personal disposable income is that part of your personal income after you paid your personal taxes. That is that part of income left after personal tax 
has been deducted. We look at gross domestic product. Gross domestic product has a money value of goods and services produced by factors of production located within the country within a period of one year. While the gross national income, or could also be called gross national product, represents the money value of goods and services produced by a nation's resources, irrespective of where the resources are located. Whether they are within the country or out of the country, they are all included in a, as far as gross national income is concerned. We look at other concepts like depreciation. It is a wear and tear of capital assets over time. Actually, it is also called a replacement investment or capital consumption. Then we have uh, income per head or income per capita. It is the income per head of the population. Actually, it's gotten by dividing the national output by the population. Then we look at um, nominal national income. That is national income at current prices. So we're talking about the money value of goods and services that are estimated at the prices that are prevailing in the market as at current prices. Meanwhile, the real national income, our real national income, uh, is a money national income at constant prices. That is, the output of goods and the money value of goods and services estimated at constant prices. In this case, we have to be uh, selecting a base here in order to get the, the real output. Now, let's look at um, the various ways that we could measure national income. Actually, there are three approaches or three methods of measuring national income. We'll start with the income method or approach. We have the output method. And finally, we have the expenditure method. Now, with the income method, it deals with summing all the rewards of the various factors of production. We're talking about rent, interest, profit, and wages. While the output method consists of summing the output in the various sectors in the economy, that is the primary sector, the secondary, as well as the tertiary. And uh, the expenditure method has to do with summing all the expenses incurred by economic agents within the country. Let's look at the problems encountered in measuring national income. We have the problem of the underground economy, that is, undeclared economy activities. We have the problem of double counting, counting the value of output as well as the raw material used in producing that output. The effect of depreciation, usually it's very difficult to get the exact value of depreciation. We have changes in the value of money. The value of money is not constant. As prices are changing, it affects the value of money. Then we have self-provided services or services not paid for. We are talking about some of those services like the service, service of the housewife, somebody painting his own house, repairing your car, and so forth. All these are not included when calculating national income. Since national income only they only count that those uh, services that money change hands. Now let's look at the determinants of national income. We have the real allocation of resources. That is probably uh, taking resources, diverting resources from the production of consumer goods to the production of capital goods. We talk about the state of the technical knowledge. When there's an improvement in technology, everything being equal, more goods and services are going to be produced. The political situation, political stability, when there's instability, it discourages um, production activities. While when there's peace and stability, investors are encouraged to invest. We talk about the level of infrastructural development. Now, infrastructural development here, we're talking about, we're thinking about um, roads, pipe on water, electricity, and so forth. When these facilities are available, it facilitates production. 
and therefore will lead to an increase in national income. Uh, we equally have natural resources. When a country has abundant supply of natural resources, and if they are able to exploit these resources, it is going to increase uh, the output of goods and services. Now, what are the reasons for measuring national income? We're going to see the following reasons. For economic planning, it permits the government to know how to allocate scarce resources, to measure the economic progress of the country. That is, actually, from national income, we can be able to determine the rate of economic growth in that particular country. Equally, the next, to measure the living standards of the people. So national income statistics can permit us to be able to compare living standards between two dates within the same country. Because when national income is increasing, everything being equal, it means that the citizens are living better. It can equally be used to compare living standards among countries, that's between countries. Meaning that if the national income of country A is more than country B, everything being equal, living standards are higher in A than in B. It could equally be used as basis for aid and technical assistance. Multinational uh, corporations or, yeah, will easily give assistance to countries with a very low um, per capita income or national income because that shows that the country is a poor country. We're going to look at another concept, circular flow of income. That's another topic actually, it's a subtopic under our, so have the circular flow of income. The flow, which is, uh, as you can see on the slide, is the flow of payment for current domestic output and receipts for factor services passing between domestic firms and households. Now let's look on the, look at the diagram. Here we have households and firms. Now we'll see that we have factors of production that are provided by the household uh, by households to firms. Now when the firms uh, receive the factors of production, we're talking here about uh, land labor capital interpretation. When they receive the factors, they'll use these factors to produce goods and services that are going to be bought by the household. Now, equally, the factors when they are receive rewards, the blue line represents factor incomes. The firm ha has to pay the factor incomes to households. If they receive land or pay rents, receive labor wages and so forth. In turn, at the end of the day, households, the other blue line, goods and services, households, they actually have to pay for goods and services produced by the firms. So we we'll see that there is income flows from households to the firms as they are paying for goods and services. And again, the income flows again from firms to the households at factor incomes. That represents the circular flow of income, income flowing in the circle. We're going to look at uh, some types of, types of economy. We'll have um, uh, the two sector spend shift economy. Actually, we'll, look, we'll see four types. We'll start with the two sector spend shift economy. Uh, these are, it's an economy where we have only two decision makers, households and the firms. And the economy is assumed that the households do not save and uh, the firms do not invest. In other words, the firms only produce consumer goods, and this economy is highly theoretical. Then we we'll look at the two-sector frugal economy, which is a more realistic version of the two-sector. Here, there are two decision makers, that's the households and the firms. But this time around, households do not, um, they actually they save, they save part of their money, meaning that in this case, some money leaks out, and firms invest. Firms do not only produce consumer goods, they equally produce capital goods. We go to the three sector economy. Uh, it is an economy where there are three economy agents. This time around, we have the households, the firms, and the government. It is actually a, a, an economy, it does not, it's not involved with uh, other countries, it has no external trade. So just the household, firms, and the government. Now we have the last, which is the four sector economy. It can otherwise be referred to as an open economy. 
It's an economy that has economic links with other countries. That is here, we're talking about half the household, the firms, the government, and the international sector to export import. We'll look at um, equilibrium national income. Now, we'll talk about the equilibrium. Equilibrium actually simply refers to a situation, a position of rest. So, equilibrium national income is that level, income level where there is no tendency for it to either increase or decrease, meaning that the economy is just stable, the stability. Um, there are, we're going to look at uh, how the equilibrium national income can be determined. There are two main approaches that we're going to employ. We'll start with the income expenditure approach. Later on, we'll go to the, the other which is the injection withdrawal. Now, the income expenditure approach. Here, equilibrium occurs when the income is equal to aggregate demand. That is where Y represents the income or output or can equally be representing aggregate supply equals aggregate demand. Aggregate demand, we're talking about the total demand in the economy. Uh, we're talking about the demand of consumers, that's consumption, investment, that for the government by all the economy agents in the economy. We are going to present uh, uh, this first approach graphically. Now, it is uh, determined when the intersection, there is an intersection between the income line and the aggregate demand line, as we can see, where they intersect. This wire represents the equilibrium level of income when there is an intersection. Now, you have the 45 degree line is a line where income equals expenditure. At this point where the aggregate demand line intersects with this 45, with this uh, 45 degree line, we have the equilibrium level of income. Um, let's look at uh, the income or the equilibrium in the various economies using the income expenditure me uh, method or approach. Let's start with the two sector spending economy. Income will occur when, or the equilibrium rather, will occur when your income equals to consumption. In fact, that particular economy is constantly in equilibrium because your income, given that households do not save, all what they have as income will always be equal to consumption. Now, we have now the two set of frugal economy. That's an economy where the equilibrium occurs. This time around, we remember households can save and firms can invest. So, equilibrium here is when your income equals consumption plus investment. Free sector economy, the three economy agents, remember firms, households, and the government. Here, equilibrium occurs when the income, why represent income there, equals consumption plus investment plus government spending. And finally, we have the four sector economy. And uh, that's the equilibrium condition where the income equals consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net export, that's export minus import. All that represents, all this, all this represents the aggregate demand in the four sector economy. Why this is uh, aggregate demand in the three sector and so forth. Now, let's go to the second approach. The first approach is the income expenditure approach. The second now is uh, the injection and withdrawal approach or method. In this approach, equilibrium occurs where the total plant withdrawals equal plant injections. Withdrawal is represented by W and the injection is represented by G. That is, when W equals G. Graphically, the equilibrium is determined by the intersection between the withdrawal and the injection lines. As we can see, this line represents the withdrawal line. This other one is the injection. This is where they intersect, and this equilibrium level of income. So this approach, this equilibrium level of income is gotten when the total withdrawals equals the total injections. Withdrawals can otherwise be known as uh, leakages.
Now, let's look at the equilibrium in the various economies using this uh, injection withdrawal method. We'll start with the two sector frugal economy. Here, equilibrium occurs when savings equals investment. That is a level of equilibrium where saving equals investment. With the three sector economy, we have, uh, given that the government is there, equilibrium here occurs where savings plus taxes equals investment plus uh, government spending. The four sector economy, it occurs where savings plus taxes plus imports equals investment plus government spending plus export. We'll look at um, another concept on the national income, that's inflationary and the deflationary gaps. We'll start with inflationary gap, which um, occurs when the equilibrium income is more than the full employment output. Now, inflationary gap actually is when aggregate demand is more than what is needed at the equilibrium level of income. So that when there's excess aggregate demand at, uh, at the full level of income, rather, creating the gap called an inflationary gap. And then we have a deflationary gap, which occurs when aggregate demand is less than what is needed. That is, the equilibrium income is less than the full employment output. That is a deflationary gap. We look at our consumption function, another concept. Uh, first and foremost, consumption. You know, consumption just have to do with uh, making use of goods and services produced to meet our current needs. Now, consumption function shows the relationship between consumption and the level of income. It is given by this formula, C equals A plus B Y T. Now, the C there stands for the consumption, total consumption. Small a, small a here represents autonomous consumption. That is, that part of consumption when income is zero. It could be financed from past savings or borrowing. B, small b here represents the MPC, that's the marginal propensity to consume. That's the fraction of any additional income that is, uh, is consumed or is spent on consumption. YT, YT represents disposable income. That's income after taxes, direct taxes have been deducted. Now, BYT, all these represent income induced consumption. That is, the part of consumption that varies with income. As income increases, Consumption equally increases. Let's look at the propensity to consume. We're going to look at uh, the average propensity to consume and the marginal propensity to consume. The average propensity to consume is simply the fraction of income that is spent on consumption. It is given by this formula. APC equals C divided by Y. APC decimals for average propensity to consume. C there represents consumption and Y represents income. While marginal propensity to consume is a proportion of any additional income which is spent on consumption. Its own formula is MPC equals change in C divided by change in Y. Change in C as change in consumption divided by change in income. Now we'll go to the saving function in the right concept. It shows, the saving function simply shows how much will be saved at different levels of income. Remember, savings uh, simply represents part of disposable income that is not consumed. Now, the savings function is given by this formula. S equals minus A plus, you have 1 minus B, Y, T. Minus, S is sum of total savings. Minus A. Minus A here represents autonomous de savings. Autonomous de savings. Why 1 minus B? B there represents your MPC. And MPC 1 minus B now becomes MPS. So 1 minus B represents marginal propensity to save. YZ, as we saw, was um, in the past or uh, recently represents disposable income. Then the whole of this. 1 minus B, Y, D represents income induced savings, the saving level that is related to income that varies as income changes.
That is a saving function. Uh, let's look at the propensity to the propensity to save. We equally have the average price to save as well as the marginal propensity to save. The average price to save represents the fraction of income which is saved. It's given by this formula APS equals S on Y. S there stands for savings and Y stands for income. We have the marginal propensity to save as a, it is the proportion of any additional income that is saved. Proportion of any additional income that is saved is given by this formula. MPS equals the change in S divided by change in Y. Change in S then is a uh, change in savings and change in Y represents a change in uh, consumption. Sorry, change in income. Change in S, change in savings, and uh, change in Y represent a change in income. We we'll look at another concept: the paradox of thrift. Paradox of thrift explains how, under certain circumstances, an attempt to increase savings will lead to a fall in total savings. Now, this paradox. Uh, for it to be explained, there are certain assumptions that are supposed to be uh, maintained. We have to assume that the income level does not change. We assume that savings are not reinvested in the economy. The economy is closed. And um, savings are linked to income. That savings are induced, related to income. Now, if an economy, if an economy is in equilibrium and the economy attempts to increase savings. What is going to happen is that the firms are going to witness unplanned increase in their stocks, meaning that they will not be able to sell. The people are saving more, they will likely consume less, given that um, we have assumed that consumption is not changing. Now, when they save more and consume less, firms will not be able to sell and they will react by reducing their output. When output reduce, what is going to happen is that income level in that economy is going to reduce. And since savings are assumed to be related to uh, income, what is going to happen is that savings will consequently reduce, explaining the paradox of thrift, where an attempt to increase savings leads to a fall in total savings. Now we'll look at investment. Investment is uh, defined as the creation of real capital goods, including changes in stocks and work in progress. Now, we have uh, some components of investment like replacement investment, which is the creation or purchase of capital goods to replace the one out capital. We equally have net investment, which is the creation or purchase of capital goods, which increases the stock of capital. Actually, replacement investment is really meant to replace, to maintain the capital stock. Capital stock does not change to maintain the capital stock. Net investment will cause the stock to increase. We look at the principle, the multiplier principle. The multiplier principle shows how much income changes as a result of changes in expenditure. That is, it shows how probably a small change in a a small change in expenditure, it can be government spending, it can be investment, will lead to a more than proportionate change in income in the economy. It is given by the, this formula, the change in income multiplied is represented by K, change in income divided by change in expenditure, or it will be represented as 1 divide, uh, divided by W, where W there represents the proportion of total income withdrawn, or it could be the marginal proportion of leakages. Let's look at the multiplier in the various sectors. We'll start with the two-sector economy. In this case, it's a frugal economy. No, multiplier K there is equal to 1 all over 1 minus B. B represents the MPC, that's the marginal propensity to consume. The three-sector multiplier is 1 divided by 1 minus B plus BT. Now, T comes in now to represent marginal propensity to tax. 
even then the police sector and the government is there. But in the fourth sector, that is open to the rest of the world, the multiplier this time around is 1 divided by 1 minus b plus bt plus m. m there stands for the marginal propensity to import, since we are talking about the rest of the world. Let's look at another principle, the accelerator principle, which is still under national income. This principle explains the relationship between changes in consumers' demand and changes in the level of investment. Actually, it shows how a slight change in the level of demand or income in the economy will lead to a more than proportionate change in investment in that economy. That is the accelerator principle. We are going to look at another topic, money and banking. We will start by defining money, which is any commodity, any commodity that is generally accepted as a medium of exchange and for the settlement of debt. Now, before the introduction of money, we had a trade by barter. Exchange was done directly. A trade by barter, which is just a direct exchange of goods and services for other goods and services. The trade by barter actually had uh, so many drawbacks or disadvantages, such as the need for a double coincidence of ones, meaning that those in exchange are ones must coincide and must match. We have other disadvantages like the bulkiness of some of the goods. We have a uh, problem of perishability of goods, determine the value of uh, the exchange value between the goods, given that there was no measuring rock like money and so forth. Now, it's because of these disadvantages now we had uh, that money was introduced. But we had the actual introduction of money had to evolve through some stages. So, look at the evolution of the forms of money. Now, if we started with commodity money, commodities such as salt, cowries, cattle, shells, and beet were used in some communities as money called commodity money. We had equally precious metals. What of precious metals were thinking of metals such as gold and silver. They were equally used to exchange for goods and services and settle debt. But all these the commodity money, some of the perishable precious metals, it was difficult to actually bring them to very small units to each uh, exchange of small values and so forth. We had representative money. Uh, in the past, Goldsmith issued receipts for gold deposits because those, when precious metals were used as money, the owners of the precious metals could easily be attacked by thieves. So the safest place to keep these precious metals were with the goldsmiths because they had the, the safest place to keep uh, these metals. Now, the goldsmith now, later on, they were giving receipts. When they received the gold deposit, they give you a receipt. People now could use these receipts to buy, given that at any time, if you go back to a goldsmith, you get your gold. So the receipt now represented money. That's what we call a representative money. So the receipts were actually accepted as money. Then we equally have a token money. That's money whose face value is greater than the intrinsic value. It's greater than the value of actually the content, the uh, auto intrinsic value, the real value is a meta, if it's coin. Also, a token coin means that the face value, the amount that's written on the coin, is more than the meta content. That makes it token. Then we have fiat money, which actually represents legal tender. It is any commodity that is authorized by law to be accepted as a medium of exchange. That is, you are obliged to accept uh, this commodity or whatever has been decreed as money. So we call that fiat money. We have money substitute. It is any commodity which acts as a medium of exchange, but not as a store of value. It acts as a medium of exchange, but not as a store of value. We could have examples like credit cards. That's an example of a money substitute. Now we have near money, which is any commodity which acts as a medium of exchange and not as a store of value. 
it acts as a medium of exchange and not as a store of value. Now, let me come again. Money substitute any currency which acts as a medium of exchange but not as a store of value. That is okay. The near money, any currency which acts as a medium of exchange and uh, not as a store of value. We we'll have some, some small mix over here. Actually, near money is any commodity which does not act, it acts as a medium of exchange and not as a store. Okay, that's okay. Now, an example of near money here could be a treasury bill or some shares. shares you have some shares certificate. They act as a store of value. It will not, it's not here, it's there. So, error. Now, we have the demand for money as the next concept. It is uh, simply referred to the desire to hold money in liquid form. It's otherwise known as liquidity preference. When you prefer to hold money in liquid form than in other forms like probably buying, buying shares in companies and so forth. There are three main reasons why people want to hold money in liquid form. The first, we have the transaction motive, that is, for daily uh, activities, you need it probably transportation, fare, to buy food, and so forth. Then we have precautionary motive, that is, to take care of unforeseen circumstances, to take care of unforeseen circumstances like um, ill health, unexpected distress, and so forth. Then we have the speculative motive, which is money kept in order to buy and sell securities in the stock exchange, in the stock exchange market. It is actually influenced by the rate of interest. The transaction and precautionary motives, they are referred to as active balances because the money is actually, they use it to finance current expenditures and they are influenced by the level of income, influenced by the general price level, the, the interval, of, interval of payment, and so forth. While the speculative motive is uh, influenced mainly by the rate of interest. Now let's look at the supply of money. The supply of money simply refers to the stock of money in circulation at any given time in an economy, usually determined by the monetary authorities of the central bank. It is, um, we can look at a narrow definition of the supply of money, which uh, consists of assets that function mainly as a medium of exchange. Assets function mainly as a medium of exchange. In this case, the narrow definition, we are talking about coins, bank notes, and bank deposit in the site, bank deposit. Bank deposit here, we're thinking about the current account uh, deposit or site or demand deposit, where money could be drawn at any time with the use of a check. Then we have the broad definition of money. Now the broad definition of money they are assets which function more of it as a store of value. So, meaning that the broad definition includes the narrow definition plus other deposits like the time deposits, where you are given by the certificate of uh, deposits that act, act more as a store of value. You cannot actually take it to the market to buy. Then we we'll look at, uh, let's go to another concept under money and banking that's the value of money. The value of money represents uh, which is the quantity of goods and services that money can buy. That is, it is a purchasing power of money. And uh, this value of money actually is influenced by the prices. When prices are rising in an economy, what happens is that the value of money will be falling. And when prices are falling, the value of money increases. They are actually they are indirectly related. Now, we will have to look at how the value of money will be measured. We have the retail price index. The price in the retail price index and index number, which shows how the prices of the bundle of goods and services have changed over time. So what is done is the select a basket of goods. Basket of goods here should be goods that most average families they consume and try to observe how the prices are changing with a period of time. With that, we'll be able to come out with probably the value of money, the rate of inflation. Now, to do the calculations, we have the weighted price index and a non, that is a non-weighted price index, where the goods are assumed to be of equal, equal importance to the consumer. 
Then the calculation will have the weighted price index. In this case, the goods are given some weight relating to their importance. The higher the weight, the more the importance. So the goods have different levels of importance to the consumer. That's the weighted price index. Uh, let's look at another concept on that money and banking that is inflation. Inflation is a persistent rise in the general price level in the economy. Now, this rise can be due either be due to an excess demand, we are going to see that, or excess demand over supply, or an increase in the cost of production. That is why we have the two main uh, causes of inflation. We have the demand pool inflation and uh, the cost push inflation. Demand pool inflation occurs when there is an increase in aggregate demand over aggregate supply at the full employment level of income, at full employment. That is, aggregate demand is more than aggregate supply at full employment, thereby pulling up prices, causing prices to rise. That is the, uh, the demand pool inflation. Now, the other one, the cost push inflation. It is caused by an increase in the cost of production. So when the cost of production increases, which might be due to an increase in the price of raw materials, due to an increase in wage rates, uh, wages, increase in indirect taxes. When this happens, producers will be forced to increase their, their prices in order to compensate for the increase in cost, and thereby pushing up prices as a cost push inflation. Let's look at the quantity theory of money. The quantity theory of money. It explains the relationship which exists between the price level and the quantity of money. The relationship, actually, this relationship is a, a direct relationship. That is, as the quantity of money is increasing, this quantity theory states that the price level equally the, uh, will be increasing. Now, the quantity theory came to be expressed by the equation of exchange. This is the equation of exchange. MV equals PT. Now, M here has to do with the quantity of money. V represents the velocity of circulation, the number of times that money changes hands. P stands for price, price level, and T represents the volume of transactions. So, we have the quantity of money times money times multiplied by velocity of circulation. It must be equal to price times the volume of transactions. That represents the equation of exchange. It was brought forward by Ivan Fisher. Let's uh, look at commercial banks. Uh, under banking, commercial banks are financial intermediaries who collect deposits from people, from their customers, or people with surplus cash and grant loans to those with immediate needs of cash. Actually, commercial banks are joint stock companies that their main objective is to make profit because they are privately owned institutions. Their main objective is to make profit. And one of the ways they make their profit is uh, through the interest rate that they charge on, on loans. That is their main source of, uh, of uh, income. Now let's look at the functions of commercial banks. We are going to look at three main functions. There are other functions. We look at three main functions. Accepting deposits. Actually, this is the oldest function of banks. Accepting deposits for safekeeping. Now, deposits could be accepted in various accounts, right? in the current accounts, the side deposits, where withdrawals could be done without any prior notification to the bank with the use of checks. Their charges are paid by the customer to the bank. We have uh, current uh, saving accounts where the money is kept there, where you're given a passbook and you need to notify before withdrawal is done. The interest rates accrue and the customer is uh, given some interest. You have the fixed term deposit where the money is kept for a very long period of time before withdrawal. The second function is granting of loans, lending. Actually, granting of loans, this is done there are three ways. Direct lending, we do it through overdrafts. Overdraft, that is, a customer is given an amount more than what is in their account. And finally, by discounting bills. Then finally, we have 
next act as agents of payments. Commercial banks actually help their customers to do payments on their behalf. This acting as an agent of payment could be done through uh, the use of checks, use of credit transfer, standing orders, and so forth. Now let's look at the balance sheet of a bank or of a commercial bank. Balance sheet simply rep represents a document showing the assets and liabilities of a bank at a given period. Assets are the resources which the bank owns and uh, those are other people have that belong to the bank, represent the assets of the bank. Meanwhile, liabilities, they are the resources that the bank owes other economic entities. So they are liabilities. We we'll look at the sample balance sheet. We have liabilities on the left and the assets on the right. For the liabilities, we have capital, that is what is contributed by the shareholders. We have deposit into all the various accounts, fixed, uh, we have uh, current accounts, saving accounts, and the fixed term deposit. Then we have reserves. Reserves are that's profit that is kept to reinvest. Uh, profit that has not been distributed. It might not, the bank might not have reserves. So that actually might not be on all the balance sheets. Then on the assets, we have cash in till, but our coins and notes that the bank actually has, which is the most liquid assets. We have balances at the central bank, only that can be used, can be equally be called, withdrawn at any time from the central bank. Actually, that permits commercial banks to be able to borrow from the central bank. We have money at call and short notice. That's money that can be called over at any time when the need arises, usually given to discount houses. We have bills discounted. Bills discounted with our treasury bills, which are treasury bills, they have a majority of 90 days, three months. Then investment, the next investment here, shares. We have advances, which is the most profitable assets. Advances represent loans given to customers. Actually, at the end of the day, the balance sheet will always uh, balance. Total liabilities will always be equal to the total assets. Let's look at credit creation. Credit creation by commercial banks. Credit creation uh, is seen as, or could be defined as, the ability of commercial banks to increase money supply in an economy through bank deposits. Now, we remember the modern forms of money we have coins, paper money, or bank notes, and bank deposits. So, when commercial banks are able to create bank deposits, it actually means it could influence the supply of money. There are three main ways through which uh, credit creation is undertaken by commercial banks. The first is when a customer deposits cash in the bank. So, in deposit cash, your an account is created. Automatically, a deposit is created in your name. The next is when the bank buys a security. You buy a security with a check. It buys a security with a check that is uh, drawn on their name. It's equally going to cause creation of credit. And finally, sorry. And finally, when the bank grants a loan, when a loan is granted, an account is also a deposit is a uh, is created. Those are the three main ways through which commercial banks are able to create credit. Um, let's look at the central bank. The central bank, which is a government bank, is a financial institution which is responsible for the functioning of a country's financial system. Responsible for the function of a country's financial system. Actually, it's at the head of the financial system. And uh, in the case of Cameroon, our central bank is called the Bank of Central African State, BIAC, which uh, uh, there are six countries that are under that central bank, the SEMA countries. We have Cameroon, Chad, Central African Republic, Congo, and the Equatorial Guinea, and Gabon, rather. There are six. Uh, now let's look at monetary policy. 
It is a process that the central bank uses to control the supply of money and the rate of interest in order to attain some set objectives. Now, these objectives could be probably to attain a full employment level of income, to attain an equitable distribution of income, faster rate of economic growth, uh, probably balance of payment equilibrium, and so forth. We will go to the next uh, topic, which is public finance. Now, public finance actually deals with uh, the income and expenditure of the public sector. And by the public sector, we are talking about the central government, local authorities, and state enterprises. Uh, let's uh, look at some concept taxation. Uh, it's a fiscal policy which involves the imposition of compulsory levies on individuals and entities by the government. So a tax is a compulsory levy that the government is supposed to pay to the government. The government gets from individuals and entities in order to permit the government to carry out her expenditures. We we'll look at the uh, canons of taxation. These are just the principles or qualities of a good tax system. We have uh, many, many canons or many principles. Let's look at this few. The principle of equity, where a good tax should be based on people's ability to pay, can either be horizontal or vertical equity. We have uh, certainty, that is, those paying should be aware, they should know exactly how much they are paying, when they are paying, and how. It should be certain. The principle of economy, economy here means that the cost of collecting the tax should not be more than the revenue that the tax will generate as economy and convenience means uh, the payment time should be appropriate for the taxpayers to pay. At least uh, farmers should be able to pay a tax after they must have harvested. It should be convenient, it should be appropriate for them to pay. We look at system of systems of taxation. There are three tax systems. We we'll start with the progressive tax, which is uh, the tax, the one that the tax rate increases as income increases. Actually, it takes more from the rich and less from the poor, so it tends to narrow the gap between the rich and the poor. We have the regressive tax, as when the tax rate it decreases as income increases. So in this case, the poor they sacrifice more; they are going to they will suffer more than the rich. And finally, we have the proportional tax. The proportional tax is where everybody pays the same percentage with the same proportion. As the tax rate is constant as income increases. Let's look at uh, the average tax rate. The average tax rate as a proportion is a proportion of income paid as tax. Proportion of income paid as tax this is a formula. AT, ART, average rate of tax equals the tax amount on the total tax, total income, sorry, the tax amount. Total income or gross income times 101. Then we have the marginal rate of tax. Here is uh, the percentage of any increase in income that is paid as tax. Of any increase in income that is paid as tax. This is the formula. Marginal rate of tax equals change in tax amounts divided by the change in total income times 101. Let's uh, look at some types of tax or types of taxes. There are actually two main types, direct and indirect. Direct taxes are those that are levied on income of individuals and the profits of companies. So direct taxes, we have examples like company tax, uh, income tax, and so forth. While indirect taxes, they are taxes levied on goods and services. People pay them indirectly by consuming a commodity. They are taxes levied on goods and services. With indirect taxes, the burden could be shifted to the, the person paying could shift the burden to consumers through higher prices. But with the direct tax, the burden could be, cannot be shifted. Uh, another concept is fiscal policy. Fiscal policy is uh, the use of taxes and government expenditure to achieve some desired economic objectives. 
Fiscal policy actually is divided into two. We have discretionary fiscal policy and non-discretionary fiscal policy, what we call automatic stabilizers. So a discretionary fiscal policy is a deliberate manipulation of government spending and taxation to influence certain policy objectives. Then with a non-discretionary or automatic fiscal policy, these are elements of fiscal policy which regulate the level of economic activity without direct or so any direct government intervention. Actually, automatic fiscal policy are built in mechanism which are built into the system to reduce the amplitude of fluctuations in economic activities. Look at the budget. The main instrument of fiscal policy is the budget. And the budget simply refers to plan government income and expenditure, what the government plans to spend and what she plans to receive as income for the following uh, coming financial year. We have three main budgets. We have the budget surplus, deficit and balance. Budget surplus represents uh, is when planned government expenditure is less than planned government income. That's the budget surplus. Now, when the surplus, the government plans to take more from taxes and spend less. It could, uh, the objective could be to take care of an inflationary situation in the economy. We have a budget deficit. That is when planned government expenditure is greater than planned government income. In this case, that is when the government wants to boost economy activities, boost the, uh, consumption, investment, and so forth. They are going to carry out a budget deficit. Now, the balanced budget is uh, when the planned government, what the government plans to spend is exactly uh, is equal to the ex expected income. That's planned government expenditure is equal to planned government income. That's a balanced budget. Look at the national debt. National debt represents the total outstanding borrowing of the central government, both at home and abroad. Meaning that the government borrows internally and externally. Internally from individuals and banks, firms, and externally probably through uh, friendly countries, international uh, institutions like the World Bank, IMF, and so forth. And the debt of the government can either be a dead weight or a reproductive debt. A dead weight debt is the one that is meant probably for consumption, which most of it is very difficult to pay back, even that taxes will need to be increased. But a reproductive debt, which is the one that is used to acquire real assets, is, uh, it has a less burden in the economy. <clears throat> Let's look at the burden of the national debt. The burden of the national debt simply refers to the sacrifice that the government will make in order to pay interest and the loan itself. Now, this sacrifice most often is in terms of probably exporting goods without getting any imports or actually using your foreign uh, reserves in order to take care of this debt. Now, we're going to look at some revision questions. Look at some revision questions. We'll start with uh, exercise one. Questions, we'll start with MCQs. National income plus depreciation plus indirect taxes minus subsidies gives have the various options, GNP and factor cost, GDP and factor cost, GDP and market prices, GNP and market prices. National income plus depreciation plus indirect taxes. Now, for us to get our answer, we know that when we take national income, where is it plus? We're adding depreciation. Normally, gross national income or gross national product minus depreciation is going to give us national minus depreciation plus subsidies minus indirect taxes will give us national income. So if we work from that premise, we can now see that our right answer is going to be 
D, which is gross national product and market prices. Because gross national product and market prices, if you take uh, GNP and market prices, you reverse, you take plus depreciation, plus indirect taxes, minus subsidies, you're going to get a national income. Let's go to exercise two. A country's national income account contains the following. You have uh, property income from abroad, 50. Property income paid abroad, is 15. Gross national product and market price, is 500. Depreciation, is 40. Indirect taxes, is 75. And subsidies. Now, from the data, which uh, what is the value of the national income? Meaning that we are expected to calculate national income. Let's go back to the data. Now, to get national income, we have already been given our gross national product at market price. Now, if we take our gross national product and market price here. Gross national product and market price, which is 500. Now, the next thing is. We are given a depreciation. We're just going to subtract depreciation because, okay, this way is still market prices. To get national income, have to add subsidies, is 10. We have to subtract indirect taxes, 75. And then we'll sub call, add subsidies and subtract indirect taxes. We'll now change from gross national plan market price to gross national plan factor cost. And then we subtract depreciation, 40. And we're going to get our answer. Now, if we do that, the right answer is going to be A, that's 395 billion francs CFA. So that's going to be the right answer. Exercise 3. We're going to questions 3 and 4 are based on the table below relating to a two sector economy. We have the national income on the left, consumption on the right. Now, what is the value of the induced consumption when national income is 150, 150 million? That's a, that's a question. We're going to see alternative answers. They say when national income is 150, what is the value of induced consumption? Now, we have, we've seen that the total consumption at 150 is 115. And we know, we know that our autonomous consumption is 10. So we take this total consumption, 115, minus this uh, autonomous consumption, we are going to get our induced consumption. So the induced consumption is uh, 105. That is, if you take um, 115 minus 10, you give us 105. Go to the next. Question four, that's the value of, you are expected to determine the value of the multiplier. Now, for us to get the value of the multiplier, we have to be able to calculate. If we go back to our table, the multiplier is gotten by a change in a, multiplier is one, all over one minus B, where B stands for MPC. So, actually in this case, it's just one over B. Not one. Uh, so our our problem here is to calculate MPC. To calculate MPC, we just take a change in consumption. If we take a change, let's say 45 minus 10 or 80 minus 45, we get a change in consumption divided by a change in income. We change it by 15. We are going to have a value. Now, if we take now one divided by that value, is going to give up. We do that. We are going to have 0.7. Okay, we we'll get 0.7. Then 1 divided by 0.7 will give us 3.3. So our answer in this case is B, 3.3. Let's go to the next exercise, exercise 5. Question 5 is based on the data below. And given the data, it's personal income, uh, personal income tax, we have consumption, personal uh, interest payment, and personal saving. Now, what is the disposable income? 
Now, in this case, we get disposable income, we simply take our personal income minus our personal income tax. If we had transfer payments, it would have been added, but we don't have transfer payments. So we'll take our personal income minus personal income tax, and that is going to give us this uh, 480. That is uh, 570,000 minus 90,000. It gives us uh, 480,000. That represents our disposable income. Now, exercise six. Double counting in calculating gross national product can be avoided by first uh, answer only including the value of goods produced, excluding intermediate outputs, subtracting indirect taxes from the value of outputs, omitting the value of goods produced for export. Now, the right answer is going to be B, excluding intermediate output. Right answer is a B, excluding intermediate output. Now, when you add intermediate output, it gives you, it causes double counting. So when you exclude it, you'll be avoiding double counting. Exercise seven. Which of the following is concerned with how capital expenditure responds to a change in consumer's expenditure? Concerned with how capital expenditure responds to a change in consumer's expenditure. Now we have the multiplier, the accelerator, consumption function, and the marginal efficiency of capital. If you look very well, we we'll see that we are talking about the accelerator because you are asking how capital expenditure responds to a change in consumer's expenditure. So the right answer is B, the accelerator. Exercise 8. The slope of the consumption function is the A, we have propensity to consume, B, the average propensity to consume, C, total consumption, D, marginal propensity to consume. The right answer is our D, option D, that's the marginal propensity to consume. Given that the marginal propensity to consume is a change in consumption and change in income, it actually brings out, the, it shows a gradient of the consumption function. So the answer is D, marginal propensity to consume. Exercise uh, nine, if a potential output in a given economy were 1,800 billion francs and the aggregate demand at that level stands at 1,650 billion francs, there will be a, an inflationary gap, B, the saving, C, a deflationary gap, D, of a full employment. Now, if we look well, we'll see that, we see the potential output is 1,800 billion. Meanwhile, our average demand is 1,6, 1,750. Now, here it shows that average demand is less than what is needed. Every demand is less, so creating a deflationary gap. So our right answer is C, which is a deflationary gap. Exercise 10. The essential condition for an item to act as money is that it is A, highly divisible, B, legal tender, C, highly liquid, D, generally acceptable. We know the characteristics of money. The characteristics of money, the most important and significant characteristic is general acceptability. So D is going to be our best option. General, it should be generally acceptable. We'll go to the next exercise. Which of the following items extracted from a bank's balance sheet is the most profitable asset. A, advances, B, money at call, C, customers, deposits, D, balances at the central bank. Now, the most profitable is advances because they represent loans that are given out uh, to customers. 
So our right answer is um, A. That's advances. Go to the next question, exercise 12. The quantity theory of money is represented by the expression MV equals PT. If V and T are held constant, an increase in M will result in A. An increase in price B. A fall in price C. A proportionate change in price D. No change in price Now, the right answer is going to be an increase in price. Here they said, because we know that there's a direct relationship between, uh, according to the theory, there's a direct relationship between uh, an increase in uh, between M and B. Given that V and T are held constant, and we know that M and D they assume to have a direct relationship, it means that there's going to be an increase in price. That the answer is A. Exercise 13. The demand for idle money balance or balances is most closely associated with which of the following function of money? Idle money balances. Remember, the idle money balances uh, will represent uh, the speculative demand for money. A. Medium of exchange. B. Store of value. C. Standard of default payment. D. Measure of value. The best answer should be or is the store of value. We've got our idle balances. So it's going to be the store of value. Our answer is B. Store of value. Question uh, 14. Suppose a banking system has 8 billion francs in deposit and a cash ratio of 10%. What is the value of the credit multiplier? Now, to calculate our credit multiplier, we simply, the formula is uh, 1 all over cash ratio. And our cash ratio has been given as 10%. 10% means it's 0 0.1. 1 divided by 0 0.1 is going to give us 10. So our the best option is going to be and B. Option B has to be the best uh, option. Given that the credit must be money multiply is 1 all over cash ratio. We do the calculation of we'll half 10. Question 15. By national debt, we mean a. The amount borrowed by the public sector to meet expenditure. B. The sum total of all past debt accumulated by the central government. C. The total borrowing of the government outside the country. D. The amount of revenue owed to the government. Now, our right answer is going to be B, the sum total of all past debts accumulated by the government. That's option B is our best uh, answer. Exercise 16. As income increases, the tax rate increases. This definition applies to A, A regressive tax, B, Proportional tax, C, progressive tax, and D, flat rate tax. The statement represents a progressive tax. As income increases, the tax rate increases because we know that a progressive tax is that where the proportion increases or the rate increases as income increases. So our answer is C, progressive tax. We go to the next exercise, exercise 17. The practice of taxation that says people with the same income level should pay equal taxes is called A, without horizontal equity, B, vertical equity, C, perfect equity, 
the imperfect equity. Actually, horizontal equity shows that uh, or says those who are of the same income uh, level are expected to pay the same. Vertical equity explains that those who are at different income levels. So our right answer has to be A, horizontal equity. Let's go to the next question, question 18. The following are sources of government revenue except A. Privatization B. Taxation C. Realties and rent D. Nationalization They said except So privatization is a source of revenue, taxation is, a, is even the main source of revenue, royalties equally represent a source of revenue, so nationalization is not a source of revenue, so the right answer is, uh, is D. Next exercise, the following data relate to the national income of hypothetical economy. We have uh, consumption expenditure there, government expenditure, gross capital formation as part of investment, change in stocks, still part of investment, export, import, expenditure taxes, subsidies, net property income from abroad, and uh, finally depreciation. Now, we are expected to calculate the following. The first is the total domestic expenditure and market prices, total final expenditure and market prices, gross domestic product and market prices, gross domestic product and factor cost, gross national product and market prices. And six here is uh, gross national product and factor cost. And seven, finally, is uh, national income. <clears throat> now let's start with uh, total domestic expenditure and market prices. We know the formula of total domestic expenditure and market prices is C plus I plus G. C here stands for consumption, I is investment, and G is government spending. On the data, we C was given as consumption, consumption was given. I there represented gross domestic fixed capital formation and changes in stocks. So it had two elements. So, and the uh, government spending equal was given. So it means I will take consumption plus uh, gross investment plus changes in stocks and they will have government spending. That will give us consumption was 6,314. Gross domestic fiscal capital formation was 1,900. Change in stock was 10. So add these two to get our investment. Meanwhile, Government spending was 2,300. So our final answer is 10,550. When you take this plus, you add all this, you finally have this. Now the next is our total final expenditure. Total final expenditure and market prices. And the formula is the total domestic expenditure and market prices, which we already calculated, plus our export. That means we we'll take our 10,550 plus the value of the export. The value of the export is 3,200. So we'll take this plus 10,550 plus 3,200. It is going to give us 13,750 billion francs CFA. That represents the value for total final expenditure at market prices. Now, the third, the third is our gross domestic product and market prices as we calculate the formula is total final expenditure and market prices minus import we already had the value for total final expenditure previously so we'll just bring the value and then we'll subtract import so th this was the value of total final expenditure that was 13,750 minus our import is given as 3,000 3,300 on the table, on the table we saw. So our answer will be 10,450 billion francs CFB. 
that will be the gross domestic product and market prices. Now we'll now look at gross domestic product and factor cost. And uh, gross domestic product and factor cost is uh, this is the formula. It is gross domestic product and market prices minus expenditure taxes or indirect taxes plus subsidies. All these are given on the table. So the answer we had uh, gross domestic product and market prices that was 10,450 minus our expenditure taxes or indirect taxes were for 1,410 and the subsidies was 200. So it would take this minus, we take 10,450 minus 1,410 plus 200 it will give us 9,240 billion francs CAP. That represents our gross domestic product and factor cost. Next, we'll be calculating our gross national product and market prices. Gross national product and market prices. And GDP, and, uh, it's the answer, the formula rather, is gross domestic product and market prices plus net property income from abroad. Remember, net property income from abroad is property income from abroad minus property income paid abroad. It is given on the table. So that means we take 9,240 plus 100. The answer is 9,340 billion francs CFD, representing gross national product at market prices. We we'll now look at gross national product at factor cost. Gross national product and factor cost, which is gross domestic product at factor cost plus net property income from abroad. Gross domestic product and factor cost plus net property income from abroad. We already had the value for gross domestic product and factor cost, so we'll just use the value and uh, we equally have uh, on the table that for net property income from abroad. So our GDP at factor cost was two thousand was nine thousand two hundred and forty, and our net property income abroad was one hundred. So nine thousand two hundred and forty plus one hundred gives us nine thousand three hundred and forty billion francs CV. That is our GNP at factor cost. So now go we'll look at national income. For national income, that's the last. National income is. Gross national product and factor cost minus depreciation. Gross national product and factor cost minus depreciation. And this is already the value for gross national product and factor cost, 9,240. Now depreciation is given on the table. So on the table, depreciation is 10,090. So we'll take this 9,340 minus 1,090, sorry, 1,090, it gives us. 8,250 billion francs CV. That is the value of our national income. Let's go to the next exercise, exercise 20. The table below shows the consumption schedule of the hypothetical country. We have um, the values that are given there. This is income here, and this represents consumption. Now we have um, income changes here just by 100, 0, 100, 200, and so forth. You will have the consumption here. You are expected to determine the consumption function for this country. Now, to determine the consumption function, we know our consumption function will, let's go to the consumption function again. Our consumption function was given as C equals A plus B, Y, D. Now, A represents autonomous consumption and our table here autonomous consumption is that consumption at zero income level that means 80 is going to be our autonomous consumption so autonomous consumption a here has to be is going to be 80. now b here represents our mpc and our mpc is a change in consumption all over a change in in uh, income where we have yeah, MPC change in consumption by change in income. That's a change in C all by change in Y. 
But we know that a change in C, you can see on the table, a change in C at any level you can take a level of 170 minus 80, it gives us 90. Then we'll get a change in Y. A change in Y at all the levels, the change will be 100. And then now, MPC now becomes 0 0.9. That's this 90 divided by 100. That means our consumption function now is given as C equals A. This A here is 80. This is the 80 representing the A plus 0 0.9. 0 0.9 there representing B. Y Z. This is our consumption function. Now we'll look at exercise 21. You are expected to differentiate between a shift in the consumption curve and a movement along the consumption curve. A shift in the consumption curve and a movement along the consumption curve. This is our answer here. Movement or moving on the consumption curve from one point to another is caused by a change in income, meaning that only a change in income affects the movement along a consumption curve, which can, can move up, showing that income have, income have increased, or you move down, showing that income has reduced. Meanwhile, a shift in consumption is uh, brought about by changes in the determinants of consumption except changes in income, meaning that income is held constant. And the other determinants like availability of credit facilities, advertising, and so forth, they will cause they could cause the consumption function to either shift upwards or shift downwards. Either shift upwards or shift downward. But in the movement along the curve, the movement is on the same consumption curve. It does not change. Here you have changes to different positions. Now we are already at the end of this first uh, revision. Our next re revision lesson will be on international economics and economic policies. That's going to our next uh, revision. See you in the next revision session. On a tege majang matege ndom Mane tambia ninya ne njubia yen Ngani bana matege mot Ngani lakiri watege ndong Yeso kina bia jinkido Mane tambia ninya ne njubia yen Tam tama mote tam zabike Tam tama tonge tam zabike Tam tam tama mote tam zabike Mane tambia ninya ne njubia yen